Hello and welcome to Extreme Academy Live. This is where you come to advance your knowledge, advance your skills and advance your future. Thanks for advancing your career with us. Now, it's a new year. Many of you may have been on a a long uh, break. We have. We're fully refreshed. Now, something's different. Can you spot what's different? It's a little difference. Put Put a comment in the chat window or the comments if you can spot what it is before the end of my intro. It's gonna be a very short intro today because we've got a a lot to cover. Um, I just wanna do a couple of reminders. Follow us on LinkedIn if you haven't already. The team, um, Claire, if you can put up the uh, uh, LinkedIn um, URL. We really want you to uh, engage with us on LinkedIn. We're gonna be putting a lot more comment on our LinkedIn channel during uh, 2022. I just wanna remind you about the exam and the purpose of what this training is about. It's about getting certifications. It's about getting those badges. It's about putting those on your resume and using them to advance your career. Whether you're looking to get a job in the IT industry, that's what the Ex- Extreme Academy is all about. That was its origin. Or whether you're looking to advance within your own uh, career, within your current position. Um, so the end goal is to complete this training, uh, then take the exam, get the certification, put that badge on your resume and use it to advance your career. So we're in, uh, epi- this is this is week four, episode four. So at the end of this one, we'll be halfway through and there's another, at least four to come. So at the end of that, on on, uh, on week eight of the course, we'll tell you how to get access to the exam. Uh, if you've done Extreme Academy before, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know the routine, but we'll give you the details of how to take the exam at, uh, at week eight. All right, I can see Isaac. He's ready to go. He's had a good uh, good break um, over the holiday period as well, so full of energy. Uh, we've got a lot to come this week, so I hope you've got a coffee. So you're going to need it. We've got a lot more about routing or routing, um, so you'll need all your all your brain power and all your attention on uh, this episode of Extreme Academy Live. All right, Isaac, over to you. I'm going to get on the uh, Q and A panel on the chat window. So if you've got any questions, I'll see you there. Over to you, Isaac. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you for that intro. Let me too just say Happy New Year to all the viewers, to everybody, all the students who are watching this and have watched the other episodes. You enable us. So thank you very much. We really uh, are going to have a great New Year. We have to, right? After the last two years, let's make this a great one. Let's make this a great learning experience. So without further ado, let's jump in to today's lesson. Lesson number four, we dive a little bit deeper. Join me. Let's go. Claire, let's put up that slide. This slide, uh, uh, layer three, scalability and resiliency was what we uh, what we were uh, talking about. And we had spoken about layer two and about loops and all sorts of things. And layer three runs, you know, we, we know it runs on top of layer two, but layer, layer three avoids things like DHCP requests and, uh, and, uh, and things like broadcast, right? Because it doesn't allow those things out. And so it reduces the amount of, uh, broadcast that you're going to have on a network or, or eliminates them because it, it's not allowed to do that. Um, uh, layer three switches are, are generally routers are generally really expensive devices, um, uh, and, and of course the, the you know the bigger the bigger the device for the bigger the network, the more expensive uh, expensive that they are. Um, they have a lot of work to do. So when you send a frame from one network to another, it might go through 10, 11 hops. Hops routers, right? Route routers along the way, and basically each one of those routers has got to open that packet, uh, that frame, open it up, inspect the check, where's it's going to go, what's the next destination, you know, find out all of that information, make a decision which is the best route for it to go to, re re encapsulate it again, you know, remove one hop. Okay, so it was ten now, 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 you know, it's 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 a uh, it's one less, and now it sends it off to where it needs to go. And so so these routers are doing millions, hundreds of millions of, of, of frames, right, a day, or maybe billions a day, the, the, the big ones. And they have to do all of this work uh, to be able to just send that email where you want it to go or send that Instagram message wherever you want it to go. So fantastic devices, these Layer 3 uh, routers. Now, 
We were t- we've spoken about um, uh, routing in the sense that we started to look at uh, things like uh, when when routers have these routes, right? They discover they discover routes, and then they they create this routing table, and um, and then we, we spoke about things like metrics, right? There's different protocols that that that's that uh, that sit on these routers that that you would install or, or uh, enable on a network. And these protocols uh, would determine how your data moves from one network to the other. And we spoke about them. We mentioned some of them. And we, we spoke about OSPF, Open Shortest Path First. We started talking about that, and then we spoke about link state advertisements, how how they learn from each other, how the routers actually learn from each other, what the state of the network is, what's going on on, on there. And so OSPF is one of those that is, is you know used all over the place. But OSPF is not an easy protocol, right? I, I, I said if you if you wanted to build a career, if you like something like this, you could immerse yourself in OSPF completely and focus all your life's energy on OSPF and you would have a career for the rest of your life. And you would probably be a consultant and you would, you know, do projects with a whole lot of companies around the world that need those particular skills. So how do routers discover each other? Well, we we call that LSAs, right? Uh, link state advertisements. Just like, like, <laughs> You know, if, if a number of different people meeting, and you say, "Hi, I'm I, my name is uh, you know Joe Soap, and uh, and I work in the washing powder industry, and and my name is so." And you you advertise yourself now. In OSPF, the same thing happens, right? You have these concepts of areas, different areas, and you know each area is going to have their router and route tours, routers within those areas. And so for them to understand what's going on and the state of all of the neighbors around them, they have these advertisements. And in these advertisements, they give out certain bits of information. Now, to make it really easy, instead of them saying, hey, I'm here and I'm number one and everything's cool and I'm this is my ID and great and I'm running, you know, there's not just one type of advertisement. There's 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 at least I think eleven. Let me just read. I think over here there are eleven types. Eleven types of advertisements. There's advertisements with just within the area. There's advertisements. Look at look at this here on on the screen. So there's area area one and area zero. Right, area zero being the 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 backbone. Well, you get this router link state advertisement, uh, which is LSA type one. Type two, a network LSA, a summary. Type three, a summary between the different areas. You get a summary LSA. Then a ASBR summary LSA, and you can you can say I mean eleven types of these. So if you if you bored, OSPF is a really good protocol to help relieve your your boredom. This is something that I really suggest that you go online, um, go and read, uh, go and look for explanations um, and, te- and, and uh, you know, people who are really good at teaching OSPF, depending on what you want to do with OSPF, right? If you just want to know, oh, okay, I understand it's a routing protocol. I understand it uses LSA's link state uh, uh, advertisements to, to build its knowledge for the routers to build a their knowledge of what is happening on a network. If if that's kind of the level and you're like, oh, I'm okay with that, then this might be enough. But if you really want to get down and dirty, you know, with hands on on how to do this, you're going to have to get some labs. You're going to have to set up some equipment. You're going to have to enable the protocol. Go and watch videos. Go and read. Fantastic if you want to learn stuff. Okay. So now we're going to go to a really nice, easy... <laughs> Uh, protocol um, ISIS. No, not not ISIS. No, <laughs> not not ISIS at all. We're going to be talking about intermediate system to intermediate system, right? Intermediate system to intermediate system. Right. So at this point, let's bring up the slide, and then 
uh, we, we, we will start on here. Now, when we talk about intermediate systems, intermediate system, IS, you could also refer to this as a router, a router, right? Intermediate system to intermediate system, IS to IS. This protocol is really widely used by internet service providers. Now, um, it really is an attempt to another, originally it was uh, designed as an interior gateway protocol. Let's call it that, interior gateway protocol. That's the opposite of the exterior gateway protocols, okay? Um, something like BGP, for example, exterior gateway protocol. Interior gateway protocol to manage networks of uh, multiple networks of an organization. I think I defined it in, in the lesson two or lesson three um, uh, as an autonomous system, spoke about it as an autonomous system. So an autonomous system is a system of networks, generally speaking, of large enterprises that fall under the responsibility of a single technical resource, I suppose. Uh, so uh, a, a technical person, let's call it that. one technical person that oversees this entire network, right? Network. So in a in a large network, think about an ISP, for example, in the US or um, a large ISP here in the UK. Um, they have so many local area networks all over and all of these networks are connected together. So even though they are disparate, they are in different geographical regions, they are all connected and they form part of the same overall network. So that is what we would call an interior, ISIS, an interior gateway protocol to manage and route traffic along all of those local areas, networks. Now, if you want to connect that, if, if that network needs to talk to another network from someone else, from another provider, another ISP, then they will use those exterior protocols, the like a BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. OK, so that's kind of the the differentiator uh, around um, around ISIS. It is similar in many ways to OSPF because it uses Dijkstra. Remember Edgar Dijkstra, the Dutchman, uh, who created this this uh, mathematical formula, really, to uh, to describe um, uh, to describe um, in mathematics the shortest route. How how would you get from point A to point B mathematically and, and you know the open shortest path first or or um shortest path route uh that that is dykstra it's also used in um in o in ospf um very fast convergence time remember we spoke about convergence time convergence is when every router in your network reflects exactly the same information so networks that are that are constantly changing constantly growing those are really, really active, and you need to have very fast convergence. Um, I was chatting to a friend of mine, and he was saying, "Well, nowadays ISIS is, you know, converging uh, at, at two hundred milliseconds. Can you imagine that? Two hundred milliseconds to converge a really n a large network. That's pretty stupendous, right? In terms of performance, it's like wow, that you can converge a network that quickly and re and and react to changes that quickly." No wonder it's such a um, uh, no wonder it's such a popular uh, protocol. It uses hellos right to to establish adjacencies. So just like when I moved into the to to the area, hello, go meet my neighbor. Hello, meet my neighbor. It uses this process of hellos to to create the adjacencies to itself. And the other thing about it is it uses a hierarchical structure. Remember, we spoke about that a little bit. Most of these 
very uh, very scalable technologies something even like dns right um it's hierarchical which makes it work and which makes it perform and which makes it have the ability to scale you know almost infinitely right hierarchical networks so it makes efficient use of memory processor uh, processor power bandwidth all of those uh, all of those things makes a lot of sense um uh ISIS runs directly over layer 2 ethernet right so layer 2 we're talking about layer 3 but we, when we're talking about this protocol we're saying it this protocol runs directly on top of layer 2 uh, ethernet it uses these LSPs to exchange uh link state information as well and in a sense, it, it, you'll see as, as we go along, you're going to see this term come up, TLVs. It uses TLVs. And TLVs are really a form of a, a sophisticated uh, database. T standing for type. So think about a database if the column heading was type, right? The kind of field, you know, what do you store in that particular field? So if you had an Excel spreadsheet, you know, Type could be the month, you know, a, a month that would describe January, February, March. So T being type, um, L being the length, you know, the length of the field, which is going to, to vary and, and, and measured in, 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 uh, in bits. And then you're going to have value and, and the, the, the value is the actual variable length of bits that contain the actual, uh, the actual um, uh, data in the actual in the message itself. So you can see that it's it's quite simple in in that way. But a database with those three uh, those those three headings per se, well, that's quite linear. That should be hugely fast, and hence you know these two hundred milliseconds uh, convergence time. The other thing about um, about ISIS is that it is much, much easier than OSPF to extend. So when you want to grow your network, when you want to increase it, add new branches, add new routers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's much easier to extend with ISIS than with something else like OSPF. Okay, so let's look at this. I'm going to be looking down and uh, and drawing on this slide. Um, we spoke about this hierarchical design. So let's take a look over here. Level uh, in ISIS, you're going to get two levels of um, of 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 routing, two routing levels. Uh, they very simply named uh, level one and level level two. So some routers are going to be on level one and this is a router on level one what it does is it builds a, a a common topology of the area in which it sits so if you look at this one here on screen okay this is a level this is a level one this one here builds the topology for this area the local topology for 49.0003 for that area so it then is able to root within that area that's that's the database that, that is queried and used when it needs to communicate within that area there we have an l1 here we have an l1 as well there we have another l1 and this 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 can happen you can have single or multiple uh, l1s and then you have an l Two. Now, L2 is one, generally, it would be a backbone router. Okay, so the backbone. So there's a backbone. Now, that what does that really mean? Well, that that is going to go, you know, uh, going to go out from, from the outer network from there. But it means that there is no other router within that particular within that particular area there's only that router so that gets labeled as an l2 and then you're going to see that some of them let's see can i change the color yeah let me change the color here to uh let's call it uh cyan let's say cyan some of them are labeled uh l1 l2 why l1 l2 because they do both things and they contain then 
two databases. You'll see that this one here forms an adjacency with the L1. So the L1 is looking after everything internally, but if it needs to communicate with something outside of the area, it then talks to L2, L1, L2. Now, L1, L2 has the two databases, one for local, one for external, and then it knows how to connect to that area, 49.00.001 or, or 0001, and it knows how to connect to the backbone, right? The other backbone, which is in the area 0004. So you can see here is an adjacency. There's an adjacency, but this is an L1, L2, Y, because it connects to that area area. So that makes a lot of sense. This this concept of being uh, hierarchical makes a lot of sense. That's why these types of convergence that we speak about is so incredibly fast, right? Because 200 milliseconds. Why? Because all of them, you know, whenever changes are, are made, they with within that area, that router knows immediately and it, it, it it synchronizes that with the router, with the L1, uh, L2, boom, and, and they immediately know. So it makes a enormous amount of sense. And that's why it's, it's such a powerful, uh, uh, such a powerful protocol. Let's go and compare, compare the two. Let's go and look at IS, IS and OSBF. And this is not a matter of saying, oh, this is better than that one. That's not the case. It's horses for courses. You pick the right protocols for the right type of, 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 of network that you need, right? So IS, ISIS, well, widely used by ISPs, whereas OSPF widely used, uh, very, very widely used in the, uh, in the enterprise. Um, ISIT, ISIS, as we've said, runs over layer two, whereas OSPF runs over IP, you know, internet runs over the internet protocol. Let's look at uh, this. Now we're going to be talking, I think in the next module, we're going to be talking about um, a little bit about fabric and we're going to be talking about security. So I'm not going to touch a lot on this here, but needless to say that in, in uh, ISIS, it's much more difficult to spoof or attack than what it is with uh, in OSPF, right? OSPF is subject to spoofing and denial denial of service DOS uh, attacks. Um, packet encoding we know it's it's the the TLV that simple database uh, format. Whereas we saw in in the the last slide that we did of OSPF that OSPF uses eleven different. Um, you know, LSA's uh, uh, link state advertising types. So it's a lot more, m a lot more complex. And not only that, OSPF is actually had to be rewritten for I for IPv6 because it was basically designed to just run on IPv4. Um, we said that ISIS very easy to extend, very easy to grow, and it uses um, uh, even something like um, uh, extreme network shortest path bridging. Um, the router is only in one area, pr plus perhaps the, the 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 backbone, right? Um, in in uh, in OSPF, the OSPF the the boundaries fall within what we call an area border let me read area border router um isis all the boundaries fall on the links and then in uh, osbf each link is based in one area so now can you see in a large network right maybe many of you watching you know you've only ever worked on small networks you know maybe in a lab and I mean, in the lab is great. You've got a couple of routers. You can already start looking at uh, at these protocols, but you can start seeing how this type of protocol in in a in a large network that's extended across Europe, extended across Asia, that's extended uh, across America, lots of branches. You can start to see the intelligence of a protocol like this, right? That if you're in a single state, for example, if, if an area happens to be a state like Texas, it's still big. You're still going to have maybe 40 or 40. I think ISIS, they recommend not more than 50 routers, but, you know, um, 
if you have 40 routers with, within a particular state, then you can see how those routers, the L1s, they just keep local local information about all the different regions within Texas itself, you know, all those sub regions that they divide that they divided up. So they would contain information like that, but there might be one or more uh, L2s that will then contain two those two databases of everything that's internal and then how they connect to the next to the next area. Texas, I don't know, Florida next to Texas, I don't know. Um, 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 you know different areas and regions. So it kind of is absolutely fantastic how these protocols work. And it really is worth your while spending time to go and understand ISIS. As I mentioned, in one of the next sessions that we're going to do, we're going to be covering ISIS a lot when we talk about fabric. And before we get there, I really encourage you, go and read as much as you can. I think it will be in the next lesson. So take the opportunity and give it a few hours on ISIS, just reading it and underst excuse me, and understanding that. Because when we come back and we and we start looking at fabric, you will start to see that picture just like a puzzle falling into place. And you'll see the beauty of this particular uh protocol. Now, what are the goals really? You know, what are the goals? for um, interdomain routing. Well, we do want to join many businesses, you know, our, our businesses in different areas. That is the objective, right? Because we are building scalable networks. We're building resilient networks. But we always have referred to the internet as being the network of networks, right? The network of networks. And so now you have organizations that are spread throughout the region, like in the US, spread throughout there. But those are just networks. They need to connect to other networks. So for all of this to work, for the internet to work, you start to see that we need something very similar. We, we need ISPs to talk to ISPs and businesses to talk to ISPs and ISPs to talk to government and government to talk to. You can see, right, the picture becomes clearer. The, 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 the fog starts to disappear as you start to look at this and say, OK, I now see where this is going because you start with a little local LAN. And it grows and, and it becomes a wide area network. And then you grow and you have different branches and those branches grow. And then you have all these areas. They need to connect with each other, right? You have to have this, what they call the inter, inter domain routing to route traffic everywhere from Europe to America to Asia to South Pacific, all we, the, that's what the internet is. It's just a total bunch of routes all over the place. Now, of course, these these autonomous systems that I've called uh, that I've that are that I've defined before, they need trust, right? You you need to be careful who you trust. I mean, do you trust your neighbor? Mm, my next door neighbor is okay. That one is also okay. <laughs> you know, but kind of. You can see in a world of internet, you can see in a world where there are literally thousands of autonomous uh, systems, autonomous areas in terms of internet, how it's really important. Security and trust is really important. The uh, um, authentication, right? Just opening up areas, you, you got to have a high level of trust. So, um, Routing policies uh, between autonomous systems, they might not always follow the optimum uh, path. It doesn't always work like that. Um, systems need to connect generally with BGP. But what we'll do is we're going to take a little break over here, that one minute break that we normally do, uh, one minute 20 or so. Um, so just hit that clock just for you to quickly get some water, whatever, come back and we'll start here in about a minute something. Uh, we'll be back. You'll hear the, we'll, you'll hear the beep, 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 beep uh, when, it's, when it's time to start.
Okay. Um, just bef- just before that break, we were on this slide, and I wanted to mention something here, um, which was this value uh, here in in yellow. Um, look at that number there. This this slide was taken a while ago by logging onto one of the big big uh you know cisco routers that that runs you know backbones of the of the internet and you run that command once you log on you can actually go in and run that command uh, show ip bgp sum and just look at that number over there 860 more than eight so this was taken quite a while ago the last time i checked that had gone up significantly 860 thousand aggregated rules routes eight hundred and sixty thousand aggregated routes on this interwoven mesh of a network that we call the internet isn't that just absolutely amazing now when you talk to people who um who work on these big networks, these internet networks, you'll hear them using certain types of um, uh, uh, phrases. You will hear them talk about autonomous systems, right? Autonomous, we've spoken about those. Autonomous systems, areas, one, two, or, or 50, 50 areas, doesn't matter, that fall under the same technical uh, control, right? And that's important because generally speaking, an area that falls under the same technical control, the same technical direction is going to have the same protocols linking them internally and then linking them externally, different ones externally, right? But they will all run the same thing. So there's a couple of um, uh, terms and and, and, uh, uh, definitions that they use. But autonomous system, if you stick with generally under a technical direction, a particular technical direction, then, then you would be pretty much okay. So these autonomous systems. Another one is Interdomain routing, which is what we're talking about here, where you have uh, basically an inter- a network of networks, uh, uh, an internet. Another one is um, interior routing protocols, which we've looked at, like ISIS, and then exterior routing protocols, uh, BGP, uh, border gateway uh, protocol. The autonomous systems, okay? So if you're a large business, you can apply for an autonomous system number. They generally are uh, between 1 to 65,535. 65, and, and they were they used to be 16-bit numbers until they kind of started uh, running out, and then they changed them to 32-bit numbers to, to increase the range, very much kind of like they did with IPv4 and, uh, and, and, IPv, and IPv6. So um, this is an important principle. There's not, I'm not going to say that you don't need to know much about autonomous systems, like everything else that we've spoken about. When, when, when talking about these terms, it's really important that you make notes, autonomous systems, AS, and then use Wikipedia as your starting point, your launching po- point to go and, um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and expand your knowledge, okay? I don't know if there's anybody uh, watching on here who's really an experienced network, you know, uh, engineer. You might be, um, but if, do do any of you do any of you have or are, are part of autonomous systems? These big systems, um, you know. Uh, um, you know, let us know on the um, on the chat over here on the side. You know, let us let us know. It would be interesting to know if we have anybody that understands autonomous systems and how these things uh, how these things actually uh, work. That would be really good to know. Now, um, a term we, we already mentioned this term: this uh, exterior gateway protocol. So you know that in this industry that we are, there are just hundreds and hundreds of of terms you know that we use so when you see e g p that stands for exterior gateway protocol it's not defining what the protocol is it's just saying oh this is an exterior not an interior an exterior gateway protocol and one of those as you see over here on screen that's an exterior gateway protocol b g P, okay, BGP, and um, uh, um, in, 
interior gateway protocol for large backbones is typically um, you know, one of the most fragile uh, parts uh, and complex parts in uh, these inter interdomains. Um, in OSPF, an, a, a connection point is an autonomous system border router. Another one of those great things, okay? ASBR, an autonomous system. That's easy. ASBR, border router. This is an OSPF router role when it speaks both OSPF on the one side and BGP on the other side, right? So we, we spoke about ISIS, but sometimes you, uh, f for whatever reason, you might, cho you might choose to use OSPF routing within a particular area, within an autonomous system. So if you do that, then the, the border router you know that that connects to an exterior uh, um, an exterior network would be known as an ASPR uh, autonomous system border router. See what I meant when I say this stuff can get hairy. This stuff can get you know really 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 uh, really deep. Okay, so so why is why is BGP so popular. Let's look at some of these reasons over here. Look at this one here. Reliable updates. That's for interdomain routing. Reliable updates is absolutely, uh, absolutely incredible. Triggered updates only. That means that when there is a change on any one of these uh, areas, that change is is triggered. There's a notification that's triggered. Oh, something has changed, and then an update happens. So it's not polling constantly, going and creating a lot of chatter. It's waiting for these, you know, change announcements, and then it does these updates. So that just reduces uh, amount of of interdomain traffic and and stuff like that. Makes a, makes a huge amount of sense. And then reach metrics. So. Rich metrics means it 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 has various metrics that it uses to calculate the best route between these different domains. And we mentioned some of those metrics earlier. They could be hops, they could be bandwidth, they could be delays, they could be you know a whole lot of different metrics. So in BGP, you have a lot of these rich metrics to make you know the, the to, to make you uh, do the best decision. Um, it runs over TCP. I mean, you know, that's that's a that's a, a great benefit, and it uses port one seventy nine, right? So you know what they say: if it doesn't work, check your port. Uh, port one seventy nine. Without that, you're not going to go anywhere when it comes to uh, when it comes to to uh, to 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 BGP. Um, so it's we've we've said already it's an exterior gateway protocol and its primary function was developed for tcp ip networks but uh is is to allow its primary function so let's ref let me start that again its primary function is to allow um autonomous systems to talk to each other to exchange information between different networks to do it reliably and to change to exchange routing information as well between these networks right it's it's really primary function is to allow a user on one network to communicate with the user on a completely different network in the next country in the next continent on mars seamlessly without any you know, without any trouble, without connecting, right? That's the purpose of uh, of BGP. BGP's popularity has really increased dramatically in the last few years, and there's 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 probably two or three main reasons for that. One of them is the explosion in the number of ISPs. Just think about the amount of people who've jumped online in the last. 10 years. I mean, forget the last 10 years, just, you know, in, in, the, in, in the last two years with COVID, how many people suddenly working from home and all of that. But last 10 years, 15 years, just imagine how many people in the world, billions of people have connected to the internet. So ISPs, that's business, that, that's their business. That has been one of the reasons. And the other one is that a lot of companies nowadays make money through, through advertisements, right? 
through through adverts and and internet sales and having this type of information interdomain routing information helps them to monetize adverts and to monetize all of this this sort of traffic that traffic just that interdomain traffic in itself is becomes a becomes a a, a business model now you get two types of uh, routers um and i don't pretend to know huge amount of this but i know that you get a border router which is um uh, external border router which sometimes referred to as e-bgp and then you get transit routers which is i dash uh, uh i dash uh, bgp when should you use bgp well uh, definitely when you have an autonomous system right and what you want to do with your autonomous system is you want to allow packets to be transitioned through your autonomous system to be able to reach other autonomous systems the internet you you, you know you you need bgp for that number 2 when your uh, when your autonomous system can contains multiple connections to other autonomous systems so if if you have that you need bgp that's a good place to use uh, bgp if it's required to manipulate the flow of traffic that enters and leaves it, you need BGP. If the organization has a full understanding of the effects and drawbacks of BGP, then you can use it. Don't use BGP because you think it's a good idea. Make sure if you turn on BGP. But you know, if you've got an autonomous system and you are that size already, then you'll have BGP and you'll have engineers that know what they're doing with uh, BGP. There's probably a, a list of reasons as well, a, a number of reasons as well, why you might not want to uh, to use uh, to use BGP. Right? That also uh, that also can um, can happen. So why not use BGP? Well. If you have an autonomous system, okay, reason number one, if you have an autonomous system and that autonomous system doesn't have more than one connection to other autonomous systems, then BGP is probably not the right uh, connection for you. Number two, when routing policy and routing selection are not of major concerns for your organization, don't use BGP. Number three, if you have a very busy network and your BGP uh, routers don't have enough um, uh, enough memory to handle constant updates, especially if you're changing all the time, mm, I either don't use BGP or spend the money and get proper routers. Number four, when you have low bandwidth between your autonomous systems, don't use BGP. Number five, a lot of people turn on BGP on their networks. Experience tells us this. I've spoken to some consultants. They will tell you this. People turn on BGP because it's there. Oh, oh, BGP, that's a good idea. Turn it on, you know. It might work for a while. It might work for more than a while. But trust me, trust the word of consultants, the word of people who've spent a lot of, who've made a lot of money fixing things like this. If you turn it on, and you don't know what you're doing, you might not see a dramatic effect on your network today. But it will happen in the future. Without a doubt, it will happen and it will hurt you. So BGP is powerful, does a lot of stuff for you, allows you to connect to autonomous systems. It does all of this. And, and, and some of you watching this were like, I didn't even know this existed, right? It, you know, correct. We didn't even know that this stuff was actually happening. It just seems like magic. But if you work in an ISP, if you work in a large ISP or even a small ISP, this is critical stuff for you. If you work in a large enterprise, this for the for the people in in the in that are running your network for you, this is super critical stuff for them. Without this, you're not going to have resilient networks. You're not going to have scalable networks. They need to understand these technologies. I think I've mentioned it in one of the other courses. Um, I once went to a, a, a dinner with a guy here in Cambridge who worked in uh, at Bell Labs. And I sat down and I said, hey, let's talk about BGP. And he looked at me. <laughs> it's like, no, it's a bucket of hurt. It's complicated. You know, there's a lot of stuff. So 
know your BGP before you start fiddling. Let's take our 10 minute break now. Then you'll have a couple of ads and stuff like this, but please get up, walk around, stretch, go grab something to eat, go grab a bite, whatever it is, respond to your email. You know, I'll see you in 10 minutes time.
Extreme has a vision for your new world. The infinite enterprise. It's not how the world has operated in the past or will again, but where the world is going. You know your business needs to adapt for the new world of the infinite enterprise. Your business can lead from anywhere. Our world today is built around centers, institutions, locations. But we don't build systems for hospitals, stadiums, or schools. We build for the people who use them. We build them for people everywhere. We know you need to understand your customers more than ever. Your customers today are infinitely distributed. We want you to reach them where they are and let them connect with you the way they want to. We want your business to work at scale. Your customers' needs are infinite. Your business can be too. The Infinite Enterprise, where the world is going. Are you ready? Welcome back from the break. So on this slide here, I don't really want to talk much. A slide is up there, but I want to talk a little bit just about BGP in itself. When, when BGP was created, um, it really was created to handle massive amounts of routes. And with that, you know, updates, right? Because you can imagine if you have thousands and thousands, you know, of, of routes, 800,000, you know, into the main routes or whatever it was, you can imagine that BGP routers would have to handle huge amounts of loads. Just think about something like flapping. Now, if you haven't heard the term, I don't think I've mentioned that term. Uh, I don't think I've mentioned that term yet. But the idea behind flapping is something that you might have come across without even knowing what it is. You might have a network connection, and for some reason, it's connected and then it's not connected, and it's connected and it's not connection. Um, uh, um, and and you might find that it's like it's up down up down. Sometimes 
um, when when I drive my car, I've got a, a charger for my for my iPhone in the car, and if you know the Lightning connector, it, you know you can use it on on either. You can put it in either way. But the charger that I have in my car, that USB charger, um, uh, sometimes is a little bit loose and everything like that. And what happens is I'll be, I'll be driving and then I'll hear that beep, you know, like the phone is now charging and I'll, and I'll look and say, Oh, okay. And then blip. And then it goes off and goes on and it goes off and it's constantly flapping. So it might have happened to you already in, in your cars as well, but in networks, that happens as well that you'll get this flapping. So imagine you have 800,000 routes that BGP routers need to update and, and, and do all of these things. And imagine you have this, this network that's flapping. But of the 800,000, imagine just, you know, you have 1% of them that, that are flapping. They're up, they're down, they're up, they're down, they're up, they're down. And, and that, I mean, that, that happens. It's not, not making this up. That actually happens. Every time they go down, a new route would have to be figured out, right? Oh, uh, update the route. Oh, it's, uh, oh, go back to the old route. Oh, no, no, the route's down. Oh, go back. Okay. And, and advertise the route. Tell everybody. And so the designers of BGP had to think about this really carefully because, of course, convergence we've spoken about, that is a, a really important concept, convergence. And you want, generally speaking, a very, very fast convergence. But if you go for a very fast convergence on, on a protocol that's handling hundreds of thousands of routes, can you see the problem? It's it, it, it just the amount of CPU and power that would be dedicated just to do that would be astronomical, off the charts. So they had to make a decision. Do we go for convergence or do we go for scalability? What is it, you know, which, which is the one um, that we're going to choose? And they decided to go for scalability. Now, what does that mean? They implemented scalability by going to a system of batching the updates. Okay, so instead of a trigger of a flap causing automatically all the BGP routers to go and update their, their, their information, they would batch all of those updates together. So as an example, I'm, I don't know exactly how this works, but I'm going to give you an example. I start the timer now. Okay, I started right now. Bing, and I, I do that. And I record all the updates, including flapping, that happen within, say, five minutes, okay? I record all of that information. Now, if something is flapping, if you have a, 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 a network connection that is flapping constantly, then you don't record all the flapping. The only one you're really interested in is the last state before that five minute period was cut off. Okay. And that then gets applied. The, the sum of that then gets applied. And then on the next cycle, everything else will go into a batch. So instead of doing transaction by transaction in real time like that, you batch everything up and then you just batch updates, batch updates, batch updates. You do it that way. It would just be far too complicated, far too data intensive and process intensive and CPU intensive to be able to do that any other way. Now, would that work in an internal system? Chances are no. There you want it to work in real time, but there you're not working with 800,000, 900,000 different routes. Makes sense. Smart people design these protocols. They think about these things. And that's why that protocol is still in operation today, still working today, even though it was designed, you know, you know, way, 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 way back. I love these concepts. I love these ideas, how these people thought about these things. Sometimes they didn't think about everything, but it's amazing. I, 
I remember, um, I, I think I must have told the story in Academy 1, the first course or so. I had a friend in uh, South Africa who was a journalist, an IT journalist. And I remember chatting to him because I used to do reviews for the newspaper of software and things like that. And I remember having a chat to him and him saying to me that, you know, networks, uh, the internet will never be able to do video. You know, like there is so much spam today on email and everything that there isn't enough capacity to do video. Sure. <laughs> Sure. I mean, who could have foreseen, you know, Netflix? I mean, I, I still remember the very first video I ever watched on, on the internet. It was a black and white video of, I mean, you know, this size, the size of a, of a stamp of Neil M. Armstrong, you know, landing on the moon. And, and I remember saying to my wife, come and see this, come and see this. You, you won't believe it. There's like this, this, this video on the internet of, of, of Neil Armstrong. And we just sat there and we went, wow, like, wow, right? <laughs> and in 2021, you know, coming up to 2022, you know, a teenager, you know, wants to watch something on Netflix and it takes five seconds to load and it's like, oh, this rubbish. We need to upgrade bandwidth. Oh, we already got 500 megs. That's not fast enough, right? <laughs> the original designers of the internet, of TCP, IP, uh, internet protocol, um, there were certain things they could not have foreseen, I, I think. There were certain technologies, the way that we use the internet today, the video, the, the the amount of video that gets pushed down. I don't know, maybe, maybe Vince Cerf and, and those guys, maybe they foresaw that already when they designed, you know, uh, TCP IP and, and things like that. I doubt that. I doubt that they saw everything that we use today and, and still what's going to be coming down the pipe. The point being of all of this is they built protocols like TCP, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And, and we've just been able to overlay and overlay and put video and put secure transactions and put this and put that and BGP and, and IS and just overlay and overlay. And, and it's this incredibly complex. When you think about complexity, the complexity of the internet, of these interdomain routings, it's just mind blowing. It's mind blowing. But that in itself is fantastic and achievement to be able to build a protocol that can scale no matter what you check on top of it. It just keeps scaling. TCP, fantastic. IP, absolutely fantastic. So, BGP, they make forwarding decisions based on the destination IP address only, right? IP addresses. They're not using MAC addresses. They're using IP address. The source IP address doesn't affect the BGP decision at all. If an AS, if an autonomous system acts uh, as a transit autonomous system for other systems, the IP packets that are created and transmitted from the other autonomous systems are not treated differently from the IP packets that are created and transmitted from the local autonomous system. If the autonomous system has decided that the best path to reach a destination is via a specific hop, hop router, then it will route all user data traffic towards that destination via that specific next hop router. The local autonomous system makes its decision based on destination IP address only, regardless of which IP host sourced the IP packets. It's a powerful protocol. Right, let's look at the criteria that BGP considers when making a decision where to send you to. There's actually 10 of them. I'm going to be looking down as I just go um, as I just go through them. So uh, let's just set this up. And 
let me click on there. So the first criteria, all right. So you know we want the the the, the best route, and it in excludes routes with an inaccessible uh, uh, next stop. I, you know, I mean that that doesn't take uh, that doesn't take rocket science to to figure out. The next one, it prefers the highest local preference. Now, when we talk about local preference, remember we're talking about the interconnected domains. So, within autonomous systems, it's global. You know, global within autonomous systems. That's referred to as local. Prefer routes that the router that the router originated. In other words, trusted routes. If you if you want to uh, if you want to call it uh, call it call it that. Number four. Prefer 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 the shortest uh, autonomous system path when uh, compare only uh, length. So when only length is um, is is compared, um, the next one prefer lowest origin code, where the internal gateway protocol is less than the external gateway protocol, which is less than an incomplete uh, incomplete one. Number six prefer the lowest MED. Number seven, prefer the external uh, external border control protocol over the internal border control protocol. For internal paths, prefer path through the closest neighbor. Uh, yeah, I know, I, I know, I know. Uh, it gets, it gets scary, right? It, it just keeps on getting, <laughs> it just keeps on getting worse. For E.g. Uh, for EBGP for external border control protocol paths prefer the oldest, the most stable paths, and then finally prefer the paths from router with the lowest BGP router ID. How's that for BGP? How's that for blowing your mind about a particular protocol? I told you it would get hairy in the session. I told you it would get scary. Some of you are sitting there like, oh, this is my this is my tea and biscuits. This is fantastic. Good for you. Well done. I I I have found this really challenging. I found this difficult. I think most of the time the reason I have found this difficult is because I haven't worked as an engineer at an ISP. I've never worked for a huge company. When I say that, I mean, Extreme is uh, large and I work for Nokia and, and they large, but I never kind of worked in the technical IT departments, in the departments that worked with this thing day in, day out. So I heard about it, never configured it myself. And that makes it a lot more difficult, right? If you work with this technology day in, day out, day in, day out, it becomes your bread and butter. When I when I came to the, the UK, I thought I knew something about DNS. Kind, kind of, yeah, I didn't realize that. I didn't know anything about DNS. I, I kind of knew that if you got the, the numbers wrong, you know, that people would complain and say that they don't have internet access. And then I ended up working in a company that had their own DNS, you know, servers around the world and they replicated in Hong Kong and New York and Cape Town. And, you know, and it was like, what? This is, wow, I didn't know that DNS because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I learned so much because of that. And then I ended up going to, you know, um, uh, um, uh, ICANN conference in, in San Francisco. And I couldn't believe that you could have, you know, nearly 2000 people in a hotel for almost for a week and they just spoke about dns and dns and more this and ipsec and and it was like wow it, it just and i realized the more that i learned the less that i knew because i didn't know what i didn't know and i kind of feel a little bit like that with with bgp and isis if i had worked in an isp i think i would have learned so much more books can teach you for sure but hands on very little that can that can that's as good as as hands on so if you ever get the opportunity even if you can volunteer listen i'll keep my mouth shut i just want to see you know do that because you'll learn so much just from uh asking from asking questions and seeing how people manage these uh manage these systems these these big and complex uh systems 
Okay, so the next topic that we're going to move to now, <clears throat> by the way, I encourage you, <clears throat> go learn more about BGP. Read up more. Ten slides, five slides, that's not enough, you know, if you really want to be a great engineer. And this is not turning you, this course is not turning you into a, into a university graduate, not by any stretch of the imagination. But satisfy your curiosity by learning more, reading more. It will really help you and give you uh, and give you confidence. So now that we've got that out the way, we're going to start talking about quas. Quas. So quas is uh, short for um, quality of service. Quality of service. Now, this might come as a surprise to you, um, but it is possible to distinguish different types of network traffic and to prioritize different types of network traffic based on a bunch of different criteria. So I worked in a in a company before and, and we we built CDNs, right? And um, those CDNs were used to distribute updates, uh, both for uh, you know Microsoft and for uh, for Xbox. Those you know generally those updates are really large files, and so they store the files on the CDN and they make it easier for people around the world to get the files from 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 a, a location, a server that's closest to them. But when you make an HTTP request to go and get a particular file. In that request, you can identify the device that um, that that is making that request. So you could identify that this request for an update was coming from an Xbox or from a PlayStation. And if I'm a ISP, I could go to the PlayStation folk and say, hmm. I can prioritize your service, anybody coming through, you know, on an Xbox, I can prioritize the service over somebody coming in from the dark side, you know, from PlayStation, and I can give them a better experience. I just, I was like, wow, you can really do that? Yeah, you can prioritize service. Now, that was, it happened many, many, many years ago, but how does that translate today? Well, think about, prioritization within your own company. Think about prioritizing traffic based on the application. For example, voice traffic. If I'm talking to a colleague, to a customer on the phone, now, I mean, you know, if we had offices and people were still working, imagine you're on an IP phone and you're chatting to somebody trying to close a deal. Imagine if the conversation's going, can you, can you please, I'm not, a lot of jitter. What does that really translate to? Uh, essentially a bad experience. And do you see how something like that, if we go back to the first lesson where we spoke about business outcomes, if part of your business outcomes is to be efficient, to be you know productive, to do all of those things, imagine to give a customer great customer service. Imagine if a customer is phoning you because they can't configure something and because of your prioritization, the way you've prioritized your network traffic, you haven't allocated any quality of service. So Jimmy in the back there, he's playing, you know, computer games, you know, that are eating up in 4K, you know, that are that's eating up your entire bandwidth, but your network hasn't, you haven't applied any quality of service. So it treats the gaming packets exactly the same way as it treats the Microsoft Outlook email packets the same way as it chats and, and, uh, and treats voice. So when we talk about quality of service, this is what we are referring to. Now, some of you, of course, like, oh, oh this is so boring. But if you don't know, then you don't know. 
And now, as we get into this, uh, you know, into this section of it, it's not a different model, same section, we're going to start looking at quality of service and what it actually means on a network. What does it mean on a network? So let's go over to the uh, first slide over here. Why, why, why do we need quality of service, right? Well, lack of bandwidth. Nowadays, you can get a 100 meg pipe, you know, to an office, and it doesn't cost you tons of money, okay? When I started, uh, when I started in South Africa running my business and consulting to other companies, um, we ran an office with, I think it was around 25 people, an office with 25 people with a single 56K modem and, you know, with less than one megabyte, one megabit per second, uh, you know, internet speed. And we run an entire company, right? Like that. I mean, it, it's ludicrous. If you think about it today, it's like, how on earth did you do something like that? It, it, it was possible, you know, <laughs> it really was. And we, and we did it. And it wasn't a small company, um, either because bandwidth was so incredibly expensive at that time in South Africa. So bandwidth was the, was the big restrainer, you know, the, the company that I was doing work for this one that I'm talking about, they were a French company. And they had the subsidiary in South Africa. And the French company decided, nope, you have to get a leased line. And I think we went for a one, no, for a 64, 64 kilobit, you know, um, leased line. And that leased line, that single leased line blew the entire IT budget for the whole company for an entire year per month. So French company said, you know, you have to do it. End of story. There's no ifs, no buts. 64 meg line, 64 kilobit per second line was more expensive than the per month was more expensive than the whole IT cost that company had budgeted for the year. They had to make special provision for that. So bandwidth is one of those reasons why we need uh, quality of service to optimize the bandwidth, right? You have all these applications fighting to get through on that same pipe. Well, we need to optimize because we need quality of service. End-to-end -end delay, fixed and variable. Um, so packets have to travel across many networks, many, many points. Uh, an access point, you think about why it's got to go for an access point, then go back to a switch, and then from there to another switch, and then to another switch, back to the core, make all the route back. You know, all of those things add up to, to lags. When you are coming to the end of the month and your SAP financial systems are running in the background, you need that information to get to you really, really quickly. Jitter, as we kick jitter, right? We, we know what that is. And packet, uh, packets may have to be dropped. So that's something that really does happen. When, think about a queue, you know, yeah, in, in the UK, people love to queue. In fact, let me give you some advice. If you've never been to the UK and you come here for the first time and you decide you want to go you know, to a movie or to a theater and you see a queue of people, you know, of British people standing in the queue. Never, ever, ever jump the queue. Just don't do it. <laughs> Just trust me on that. We love queues. We love to stand in queues. Sometimes we stand in queues for no reason, just because there's a queue. Well, if there's a queue, it must be because there's something good. We get to the front of the queue. Oh, what's this for? Oh, it's for this movie. Oh, no, I don't want to watch a movie. No, okay, no problem. And off I go, right? British people are the best queuers in the world. But if you're not British, you stand in the queue, you stand there for five minutes, it's like, ah, you know what? I'm impatient. Ah, I'm, I'm going to go. And you drop out the queue. That's the same thing that happens in networks. When you have networks and there's a lot of traffic happening, if it's too congested, packets just get dropped off that queue. 
right? That's not good. We we don't we don't like uh, we we don't like that. So let's look at some of the terminology um, that we use when we talk about uh, quality of service quas. Okay, um, classification, right? Term classification. Each class oriented mechanism has to support some type of classification, right? You have to have you have to have these classifications so that you can say if the traffic matches this if the the bit rate does this then you can then do this do that so that's kind of really makes sense marking used to mark packets based on classification think about that example i gave you of of the xbox and the and the um uh, and and the playstation if I notice that this is an Xbox, I can mark those packets so that when those packets hit my network, when they come into my network, they are marked. And as they travel through my network, through the network, they carry that marking with them. Think it almost like a like a tag. Hey, I'm 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 Xbox. Give me higher priority than than you give the uh, the uh, the the PS2. Per hop behavior, the individual action performed at each diff server note node the ap a switch router so the individual action that's performed according to policy so what is it what is the action that i need to do at each hop at each point where it hits a device routing switching access point what do i need to do with this trust boundary the perimeter beyond uh, which QS markets are not trusted by the recipient. Uh, the perimeter beyond which quality of service markets are not trusted by the recipient. Tail drop occurs when a packet is dropped because its queue is full, typically as a result of congestion, like the British queues. This results in packet loss and uh, a delay or service, you know, a, a jitter, excessive jitter. Congestion management, queuing methods, FIFO. Have you heard of FIFO? They they use that a lot when, when they need to fire people. They just say first in, first out, right? First in, first out. Um uh there's there's different mechanisms. We'll I'm not sure what all of these are. Let's see if we can get them uh get them defined. Congestion avoidance. Minimize the effect of TCP synchronization, random early detection techniques, policing, creates an artificial feeling on the amount of bedwork that may be consumed, traffic exceeding the cap uh, and be remarked or uh, uh, remarked or dropped, and then shaping, like policy, uh, like policing, but buffers excess traffic for delayed transmission. So it, 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 Buffers the, the shaping, so it takes the the excess traffic and it kind of buffers it, cues it up, and then transmits it a little bit later. So makes efficient use of the network, but introduces a good uh, a little delay. Now, um, you can immediately see that this could be applied to certain things really well, but others not at all. So, for example, if you're transferring a large file from A to B. You know what? If it takes 10 minutes or 12 minutes, so what? Who cares? You know, you say, I'm going to transmit this file. It's a six gig file. Send it. So what? Who cares? It doesn't really matter. I can, I can queue that. I can put that into a buffer. But if I try and do that with a voice call, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty bad, right? Uh, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, it's not going to work that well. So what are the causes of delays? Processing delay. You remember the uh, episode three, I think it was, when I was talking about looping, right? Looping. And that one machine, when A wanted to talk to B, and there was there was a, a broadcast, okay? And what happened is because I had a loop in my network, 
B was getting so was getting flooded with so many packets that it couldn't process fast enough. It couldn't get the response out that it needed. Okay, and that obviously is going to create a massive problem because it it tries to put it in the queue to go out, but it's just it cannot handle the amount of traffic come uh, coming in. So processor delay, um, processor delay. Think of it as a you know a traffic delay. Um, um, let me just move this here. A traffic delay that you would see on the way into work, right? You know, just some accident, something happened up up front, and everybody is you know waiting um, in in the queue. Um, so queuing delay. The time a packet resides in the output queue of a router. Now. Again, don't think when we're talking about this that we're measuring this in minutes, right, or hours. When we say queue, yes, British people love queuing, but even though they might be in a queue for, by the way, the best queue in the world, without a doubt, when we talk best queue in the world, Wimbledon. Just there's nothing better and, and more spectacular than watching the queues. But um, queuing, queuing delays, you know, how long? We're not talking about hours or minutes. We're talking about sometimes milliseconds, not maybe seconds, but, you know, milliseconds. You know, it, it's small numbers, but it adds up when you're having hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of packets. It adds up right to delays and all of you have seen this you've all experienced this sometimes you come home or, or you go to work and your network is flying everything is super fast other times it's like oh this network is crawling today how many times do you phone someone and the person says to you oh the computer is so slow and you see them click 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 why it's not the computer that's slow. It's nothing to do with that. It's the network. There's delays on that network caused by all sorts of things. Serialization. Um, times it takes to place the bits on the wire. Remember, a packet, you know, when you put some information, when you send an information, that has going to be chopped up to a whole lot of little pieces and then encapsulated, encapsulated, addressing this had, you know, encryption added to it. All of these things goes down that OSI model and eventually goes out. But putting all of that in order, all of this takes takes time, right? Propagation delay, the time it takes to transmit a packet, you know, a courier. From A to B, how long does it take? The same thing. All of these little bits and pieces, they all add up. So how do you solve them, right? Well, some of them are quite easy to solve. Upgrade the link. Upgrade the link. We like to say, you know, it's the most expensive. Well, yes and, yes and no. You can spend a lot of money depending on the type of link that you get. Thank goodness that bandwidth gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But if you have a lot of congestion, you have a lot of this processing queuing delay, well, one of the ways that you can do it is make a wider highway, put more lanes in place. That certainly solves a, a lot of problems. You can see it at your home. Forward the important packets first. Quality of service, right? Forward the important packets. What are the packets? What are the most important packets? Quality of service. If you've tagged them, if you know what they are, and you've told your routers and your network and the switches and everything what they are, then they can treat them. Uh, they can they can treat them cleverly and give them prioritization. Compress the payload, right? Compress the payload. <laughs> you know, there was a time where we would compress every attachment, right, to make it go faster. I've always said, if you want to have great programmers, get guys from South Africa. Because they're so used to working in 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 uh, with little bandwidth, you know that they make code really really tight, you know. So there's no there's no there's nothing you know there's nothing extraneous. Like make it as quick as quickly as you can. So if you can compress the payload, well, do it. You know, compress IP packet headers. These things are all small in themselves. They are really small little bits and bytes, but when you add it to when you add it together they make um when you add it together they make a very good uh reduction overall 
little bits and pieces, all of these little things make a change and they improve things dramatically. So at that point, let's do the next one minute, 20 second break designed to get you out of your chair, just, you know, raising your arms, stretching, get the blood circulation going. I'll see you back here in one minute, 20 more or less. Sorry, I went on really for too long uh, without a break. So let's 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 continue. Let me just set. We got about uh, ten minutes, and then and then we uh, and then we land uh, more or less. Uh, okay, yeah. Here is what I wanted to 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 talk about: tail drops. You can see this guy here, right? That's that's not the British guy. <laughs> That that's not the Brit. That's that's a tourist who came here and didn't want to stand uh, in the queues. So this, as mentioned before, is when you have a queue and the queue is full and you know a packet just drops off, right? And, and this is really common, the most common, in fact, um, and and mostly because of congestion. Now it it. it not only congestion, it could be other things as well, right? So you could have, for example, uh, bugs, firmware bugs, um, and, and you might need to upgrade a router because it might fix a particular issue. But kind of in this term, yeah, it, it's more that's more a technical issue rather than a queuing issue. I, I guess it could be if you have a bug in the queuing system, then that could create that as well. But generally, congestion is 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 the main culprit for this. Now, of course, you can upgrade that link. Yeah, more bandwidth, what you're gonna get? Well, you're gonna get a better solution. You're gonna get uh, um, more more highways, more lanes, more traffic can go through there. Uh, guarantee enough bandwidth, of course, for sensitive packets, you know, so that you always have enough for the voice and, and video. Video, not so much, but voice, voice is important. And you can actually, randomly drop less important packets before congestion occurs so that's actually a strategy that you can uh, that you can employ now networking engineers so delays network delay is not something unusual right it's 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 actually is it it's a design and characteristic of a network they are designed with delays in mind. It's not like it gets a delay. It's like, <gasps> what am I going to do with this? No, it it knows. If, if the network's congestion, you know, if there's delay, this is what you do. So it's not like they haven't thought about this and designed this, designed, you know, networks without thinking about this. No, there is. Um, and network engineers talk about delay and they use kind of four terms. Processing delay, the time that it takes a router to process a the the a packet header okay now you don't buy good routers you know for 4 pound 99 or for 499 uh 4 euros 99 it doesn't work like that because routers need processing power so for you to understand you can have powerful routers but they still have to deal with hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of packets. So 
processing delay is the time it takes for them to to unpack you know to unpack that and process the packet here okay it's going where where is it going what are we, what is it How, you know what da, 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 reduce it's got a, another term that they use is queuing delay all right the time that this guy over here spends in the queue the the time that this guy is prepared to spend in the queue before he starts blowing steam and like oh, i'm out of here this is crazy these these brits are crazy right the next one is transmission delay right transmission delay the time it takes to put the bits you know onto the onto the cable that you know that transmission delay i guess we refer to it as delay it's actually just how long it actually takes. But you get the idea what we're trying to say over here. And then the propagation delay, the time for the uh, for the packet or the signal to reach its destination. So when you hear engineers talk about that, now you kind of know what it is. And so now we get here and we'll land, uh, I think, just after just after this. We get here and we start to look at ways that engineers, networking engineers have, have come up with structured systems to, to categorize quality of service models. This you have most certainly heard before, best effort, right? Best effort. In South Africa, we had ADSL, ADSL, yeah, ADSL connections. And they used to say to us, that's best effort. There's best effort. You know, that's it. There's no support, nothing. It's just best effort. If you wanted a that 64 kilobit per second line that I told you about, that wasn't best effort. That was guaranteed. There was a quality of, but we, we'll get to that. So look at this. Known best effort as BE makes sense. Um, it, it's a kind of, we'll do our best, you know, we'll do our best service. Thank you very much. Um, uh, internet reality. So think about, you know, internet general traffic. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's our best effort. It, it works fantastic today. Well, tomorrow might not work so well. Um, your home service, best effort. Um, like regular mail. That's a good description to use. Like regular mail, cheap and cheerful. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, and there's no quality of service, uh, policies applied. So here, your typical home service that you that you have it up even though even though some of the home services are really really good but they really fall into that category right if you're paying 20 pounds a month or 30 pounds a month that's about as good as you're going to get what's the next level up from that diff serve differentiated dif differentiated services okay it's all in the name differentiated services um this one is not so much do our best it's managed fairness service managed fairness um this company that i worked at had that 64k that's what they gave you that's what you paid for but they had this thing of managed services and and they would say well we understand that when everybody comes in in the morning, that people will, you know, they, they will come in and everybody will want to check their mail. And so for a period of time in the morning, it you, we will allow you to burst. So you can burst the traffic outside of that 64K. You can maybe go to 90K or 100K and then it will come down again. And then around lunchtime, we'll see it go up. And then before the end of the day, it goes up and down, right? So they would then say, well, we'll use this methodology called 95th percentile. So for 95% of the day, you know, you are within that 64K, which is absolutely great. So we'll allow you to burst. It's kind of a fairness uh, model. That's what we illustrate and what the, the type of thing we're talking about here. The focus is very much on enterprise. This is not a, this is a differentiated. So maybe premium ISPs, but the focus really here is enterprise. It's like a package delivery service. Yeah. You know, this one here is like regular mail package delivery. Yeah. So we need you to sign here that you've received it. And here's a photo of the package, you know, outside your home or whatever it is. We get it. Uh, perfect for most businesses. So most businesses, yeah, the cost is good. They get a decent service. Fantastic. Packets are individually classified and marked. Policy, you know, are made. Policy decisions are made. Yeah, okay, that's good. We we like differentiated services or diff serve. Then we um, diff serve, and then finally we look at integrated services. Here, 
known as InServe, again, you know, guaranteed service, guaranteed service. So this one here was managed fairness. This one was, well, we do our best, right? We do our best, yeah, well, whatever. This one is guaranteed. So this is white glove service, right? Oh, this is fantastic. Service provider focus. So the focus here is not on enterprise. The focus here is on the on you know the, the really guys right up at the top. So service provider, the big service provider. Yeah, that's where the focus is. They've got Muller, and that's where it is. Like a private courier. Imagine that. Not just a, a DHL, but a private courier. Expensive to deploy and support but great for SLAs. So if you have SLAs, you have to respond within, you know, 60 minutes or whatever it is, you know, that's then in, in integrated uh, um, services. And then, you know, there's there's ways to reserve bandwidth per flow. So let's look at that in, in, a, in a, um, uh, a graphical way, you know, just to make it interesting, right? Um, <laughs> these things are so famous. You see them all over in, in, in the UK. It gets there when it gets there. Listen, there's a big difference, right? If you put a letter in the post in the UK, almost guaranteed the next day it's at the destination. Uh, if you put a post in the letterbox in South Africa, uh, mm, 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 it might get there sometime within the next six months. <laughs> I know my South African colleagues, it's, you know, <laughs> maybe it's better today. I don't, I don't know. Uh, the inserve, you know, the 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 expensive one. Oh, that's that's a private jet. We, we it will get there by ten thirty, right? Ah, we like that. Listen, there are instances where you need this. Imagine you're a stock exchange company. You've got money. You, this is what you want. You do not want best effort if you're a stock exchange company or if you're a, a nuclear power station. It just it just doesn't work like that, right? Predictable behavior, guaranteed. Um, no other traffic can use you know that particular amount of bandwidth, that reserved bandwidth. It's like no other plane can land at that time at that private airport. That's what it is. It's like you're having your own private plane. Um, and then you know diff serve, right? It's a standard courier. Do you want overnight serve? Uh, do you want two day deliver, seven day delivery? Um, you know, and it has all of those benefits. And generally speaking, most businesses, this is more than enough. And with that, we will land today. That concludes lesson four. I hope you guys have enjoyed that. As we said in the beginning, it gets a little bit deeper as we go through this course. Remember, next week we have a guest. Um, we're really going to be unpacking some things, especially around fabric, which I know a lot of you have wanted to know and have wanted to uh, understand a little bit more. So we will touch on fabric a little bit more with a guest next week. Hey, have an absolutely fantastic week. See you back here next week. Same time, same place. Cheers. Cheers.